JD, I noticed you got a haircut, bro. Family comes in, you get all gussied up. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, good having all of you here. We hear about you on a regular basis. JD and I, we ride to church together every Sunday, so on a lot of Sundays. So uh, good to have you with us this morning. Try this song together with us today. We'll uh, sing it so the neighbors can hear. What do you think? Do you like this one, huh? All right. He says it's a Christmas tune. Can be. Try it with me. Oh, sing to the king. He's coming to reign. Oh, to Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Life and salvation is in. You guys get this many hugs in Texas? Do you? Yeah. If we kept playing, they'd keep hugging. That's where it works, yeah. Good to be in church today, guys. Here to give him all the thanks and all the praise, huh? Aren't you glad he loved us? Wow. Love that passage there in the book of Romans tells us that God has demonstrated his love for us. These guys are busy. Yeah, we know. 
Well, Linda, she gets to church, she got to catch up, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Now, I love that passage where it tells us there, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, God has demonstrated his love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because of his love. That's why we're here this morning, isn't it? He loved us first. As a little boy growing up in church, I remember singing that song, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. He first loved me. Amen. Amen. Try this one with us this morning. Linda, are you done with your meeting? You done with your meeting? Linda? Yeah? Okay. Try this. Settle down, Jay. Come on. Settle down. We love you, buddy. seat this morning sounds so good they'll keep singing with us today you know when uh, Tyler was a little boy uh, a long time ago he hadn't been a little boy for a long time what is he 30 is he 34 is that right man I don't like it when Tyler's 34 because because I <laughs> I still feel 34. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I still pe I see people who are 34, and I think, though, there's an older guy. <laughs> Lee, it's, it's the immaturity. That's what it is. It's paying off for me right now. It really is. Now, but when Tyler was a little boy, I remember one, one morning he got up, and he smelled bacon. And, more oh, he got excited. Linda, don't shake your head. It's true. I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> With all the joy he could muster, I mean, little sleepy eyes and everything, he come out and he says, Is Grandma here? 
because we were a serial kind of house, you know. So, his thought was, we had bacon when grandma came. This song, I usually throw into our Sunday mornings when Tyler's here. He, he was going to be with us this morning, and we've had some things change a little bit, so we're going to go see them after we're done with church today. But I love this song, and Tyler loves this one too. And you know what? I'm so glad. I, I'm not happy about 34. But I'm glad he loves this song. I'm glad he loves it. Wow. Because the song says, as you can see in the first line, my Jesus, <laughs> my Savior. Aren't you glad today that he's our Savior? Man, we've got a lot to celebrate today. Let's worship him with this song. I love the words. Try it with me. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like all of my days I want to praise Wonders of your mighty love My comfort My shelter Tower of refuge Strength Let every breath All that I have Never cease to time we have just to come and lift our hands, lift our hearts and worship you. Lord, we give you all that we say and all that we do right here this morning. Trust, Lord, that every need that's represented here, Lord, it'll just be met beyond our 
expectations. Lord, you know the needs before we ask. Thank you. You have a plan even for those needs that are in our lives. You're molding, you're shaping us today. Lord, just continue your work in us. Use today to bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, prepare our hearts for your word that we're about to receive today, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor was sharing last week, what did you say, 200, over 200 <coughs> writings that are considered yep, sacred writings. Sacred writings. And this book that we carry every day, huh? the book that we have at home, sometimes gathering a little more dust than it should. Hmm. This book that we carry here this morning that we're about to open up and get into, God has proved it over and over and over again. Proved himself to be the one true God. Amen. Amen. Sing this together with us this morning. Be our last song. in the dark song lights up the stars oh one breath that gives life one sovereign power who speaks thunder and fire oh one Lord and one
This is supposed to be my anchor to keep me in place, but it usually doesn't work too well. We're going to try. We have been looking at for the last, I, I, this should have been, last week was four, right? Fifth part of what we've been doing? Fifth part? Okay, so stick five up there if you want, since I didn't. Do I? You've got, you've got helpers on both sides today. You're good. Okay, let's lay out and uh, hopefully jog our memory, or you already know it. You don't need jog. Do you get it? What are the three areas we're looking at concerning Scripture? Start with the first. It starts with the R. Revelation. Inspiration. And illumination. So last night, in the conversation, uh, one of Tom's uncles said, well, what you, what you preaching on tomorrow? I said, oh, inspiration. Oh, that's too broad. Okay. Actually, it isn't. Not at all. Revelation is the word for unveiling or uncovering. God is not trying to hide from you or me. He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to know that he is God. He alone is God. He wants us to know his nature. He is holy, righteous, just. He is sovereign of all things. He knows all things. Notwithstanding some of the stuff that's being taught out there today, God wants us to understand he is God and we are not. Therefore, he wants to reveal himself, and he only does it through Scripture. In times past, we saw in Hebrews 1, God spoke in many ways and in many methods, and in these last days, which started 2,000 years ago, has spoken to us through his Son. Christ is the full and final revelation of what God has to say. So anytime you get around groups that are, here's a new word, God's doing a new thing. I know the music's popular on our stations and all that. Uh, that's not good doctrine. It's not good Bible. It, 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 it's good church stuff that maybe makes us feel better. But ultimately, God has revealed himself as he has revealed him. He does not give us the option to redesign who he is. Therefore, notwithstanding, and I'm going to go there one more time, the shack, that is a wonderful story about a man who had a seven-year-old daughter abducted and never got her back, and he's trying to work through this loss and this anger. And so God the Father shows up as the black woman who likes to bake cookies in the kitchen, and Jesus is the carpenter who also likes to hang out at the fishing hole, and the Holy Spirit is an Asian gal who likes to impart philosophical statements every now and then. Okay, while that may make a good story, it's a really bad Bible. So we are not free to reinterpret who we want God to be. He has already revealed himself for who he is. In Scripture, there is no change in that. There is no modification. And notwithstanding the trend today of not only the world but the church, Scripture is given by God. It's not man-made. It's not man-breathed. And we've looked at that. That's your Second Timothy uh, 3, 16 and 17. We're going to look at some of this again. I told you the last few weeks, if you feel like you've heard this before, good. You're remembering that you heard it before. Repetition works. It is good. It won't be exhaustive today. We are still dealing primarily with concepts. This is that second big concept of inspiration. Where did the Bible come from? How did we get it? We need to understand, and I pointed this out last week, probably each week, uh, according to Ted Turner's, uh, all of his networks, which would be Learning Channel, the Hysterical Channel, the... Discovery Channel, all of, the, all of that sort of stuff. It gives a whole different picture. We don't need the Bible. We need the book of Enoch. No. We don't need the Bible. We need to read the gospel according to Judas because he was just given a bad rap and we need to go back and read it. In fact, we don't need the Bible because it's probably the wrong books. We need the stuff that was hidden and had an agenda. Actually, all of the non-biblical books had an agenda and hidden, and that's why they're not in the Bible. 
And if you understand the history of that, which we will eventually get to, maybe week six or seven, some of that. But today we want to focus on inspiration, that part. Let's lay out some presuppositions. What is a presupposition? It is basically what you start with. That's your footing. That's your groundwork, okay, of thinking, moving forward. We presuppose and we make it a truth statement, these things. Inspiration means that the Holy Spirit of God superintended the human writers. He watched over, he called, he guided. In the production of Scripture so that what they wrote was precisely what God wanted written. They were able then to use their own personality, their own vocabularies, their own writing style. Paul certainly writes differently from Peter, different from James, et cetera, et cetera. Scripture that we have, 66 books of canon, slightly different in the Hebrew Bible. We've looked at that. Written by roughly 40 people over a very long period of time. God oversaw the whole process. So here's what happens today in today's thinking. Well, the originals were of God, but we don't have anything even close to original. That's not a true statement. And therefore, we don't really know if the Bible is really the real Bible because it's been messed with by people. Back in the 40s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Typically, when a major discovery like that is found, it takes every bit of 50 years to get back into the public circles, okay? Therefore, it became began to become common knowledge uh, among God's people back in the 70s and 80s. We started going, huh, something was discovered. We don't know quite what it is. Uh, there was in the 80s discovered the Ebla tablets. They are even more inclusive and broader than the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered. And here's what we know about the Dead Sea Scrolls so far. The Bible is the Bible, has remained the Bible, and nothing specifically doctrinally has ever changed in it whatsoever. It's been guarded by God, as we would expect. God's word is protected not by us, not by our safekeeping, because we know how to do that. He keeps it safe because it is his written word to lead us to the living word. Therefore, Scripture is first and foremost the book of salvation, through Christ. So we're going to presuppose that God knows what needed to be said, and he said it the way he wanted it said, and he guarded the entire process, and he continues to guide that process. Now within the group, when somebody says, what is the correct Bible to use, my, my answer is this. Use what you understand and what you will read. Does that mean then that different, and we're going to look at that too when we look at the canon and so on. When you're a young reader, you read young books, right? They're divided out that way for you in the library. Typically, grade, grade school kids are not allowed to go into the high school library and get high school books because they don't know what it's talking about. That's sort of the equivalent in how we approach the scripture. If you don't understand how to read translations, then go to a dynamic or go to a paraphrase. Just realize that those are not good study Bibles per se, and once you get to that mode, you're going to have to shift gears, okay? You're going to have to get off the tricycle and get on the 10-speed eventually, and then know when to shift and how to shift and all that sort of stuff. That comes over time. God reveals his word to us progressively, not only as scripture unfolded over hundreds and hundreds of years, but also individually. You are able to understand what you are able to receive and no less and no more. And God likes order, therefore you gotta go to first base before second, before third, before you can't, you can't cut corners, okay? So all of us are at different places of where we are in our understanding of Scripture, application, study, and all of those things. But rest assured that you as a believer have the Holy Spirit in you, and his job is to guard and watch over all of that and teach you what you need to know and reveal to you what you need to know, and he will not get ahead of you. So I let it out. Didactic teaching is not Socratic teaching. Socratic teaching is you ask a question and then a question and a question, and hopefully the truth emerges. Well, that's hopeful thinking in in sense of you hope you got what you were looking for. That's not how Jesus taught. <coughs> he taught didactically. And didactic 
means several things, and here's just a simplified approach. Socratic method assumes there is no moral base. There is no moral, immoral, everything is amoral, it's just what it is, and therefore you ask questions, whether they're offensive, unoffensive, moral, immoral, it doesn't matter. You're just trying to get the cream to rise to the crop and get to the truth. The problem is that is led by human thinking. And it'll, you'll dig a ditch and fall in it every time eventually. Didactic is something different, and it's the word used for doctrine over and over, 50 times. Type in, or however you go about concordancing things, type in the word doctrine, and it'll show up at least 50 verses, and all of those will be didactic, every one of them. Here's what didactic means. Here's some features of didactic teaching. It has a moral base to it. There is right and there is wrong. Jesus taught morally. There was a right, there was a wrong. Don't do this, do that. This is the right thing, that's the wrong. Didactic also assumes that the teacher knows the audience, the students, the recipients, knows them well enough in a personal way to begin to perceive what the needs are. Okay? And a good teacher will always do that. In public school, we got four or five at least public school teachers here and several, another four or five that are retired. You had to know your kids when they're getting it and when they're not getting it. And if they weren't getting it, you went back and you explained it again. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we're losing that. You take a test once, and you don't get to learn from failing that test. You just get a failing grade, and now you're sunk. <clears throat> so when I was doing spelling tests, the kids would first off wail and gnash their teeth that we have to have a test. Pull out a piece of paper. Oh! Fold it hot dog style. Oh! That's as opposed to hamburger, one's horizontal, one's vertical. We, those, are, those are too big a word, so we do ha hamburger, hot dog. Anyway. And then you put your name on it, and some of the kids, it takes them the entire test to get their name on it because they keep misspelling their own name or they get their whiteout out, which is hilarious in third grade, and they have a pile of crumpled up hot dogs, buns, on the floor, and the farthest they ever got was their name and maybe the date. So we do the test of 20 words. How many missed none? Put it on the board. One. How many missed three to four? Five of you. And we go through that process. I said, I'm gonna show you what happens when you increase the energy to the light bulb. We're gonna call that a five watt bulb up there, okay? That's you. Take out a piece of paper. Oh my God, here we go again. <laughs> Fold it the same way. Put your name on it, put your same name on there, put the same date on there, first word. Let's grade it. How many of you only missed one? Not one this time, about five. Everybody improved significantly. Said, okay, now we're somewhere around a 40 watt bulb. Everybody take out a piece of paper. And they're going, oh my God, <laughs> are you kidding? Fold it, hot dog, put your name, first word. By the time we did that same test three times, about 90% made 100. The others are still trying to write their name on the page. That's how Jesus taught. My disciples, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. A little time passes. My disciples, a new commandment, another commandment I have to give unto you, love one another. And can't you see them scratching their heads and say, well, he already told us that. Yeah, but you're not doing it yet. And the third time, for crying out loud, would you start at least liking each other? <laughs> and they're starting to get this process that Jesus was the master didactic teacher. He found you where you were and he began to move you where you're supposed to be, but he didn't take you too far lest you would cave in and crumble. He didn't take you short of where you needed to be. He always met you where you were and took you where you needed to be at that particular point. That's the progressive revelation of God's word for the individual believer. I can apply what I can receive. I can receive what I can believe. It's piece by piece. And here's what you begin to understand when you are growing didactically. You're not being taught all these hidden mysteries and secret stuff of Christianity. You're being taught the alphabet and how to spell words. You're being taught foundational, fundamental stuff over and over and over. So if you think you've heard this before, you have. 
you're not imagining. Jay, you ready? Pin fired up? Drank a bottle of water, you're good to go. What is the source of inspiration? Where did the Bible come from? What's the source? Ted Turner and his group say that men got together and they wanted to control the dialogue and the dynamic, and so they got together and decided what would be and what would not be, and they excluded the stuff that went against them and included the stuff that went in their favor. But anybody who's read the Bible to any degree whatsoever knows that the Bible pulls no punches in those areas. There are all kinds of disagreements of people within that story. There is no hidden agenda trying to say it only unfolds that way. 2 Peter 1.20. Knowing this first, let's rephrase that. Here is a fundamental principle of your faith alphabet. Knowing this first. To know is that word of knowledge we looked at earlier. It's to understand something, okay? To, to, it's to get the concept. Knowing this first. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Therefore, here's the conclusion, folks. Doctrinally, you cannot have opposing statements. You can't, or else the Bible is not scripture. It is not foundational. It's a moving target. Therefore, there's really only a few conclusions. One is, I'm right and you're wrong. Another is, you're right and I'm wrong. The third is, we're both wrong and God's got to teach us. But we both can't be right or else the Bible is irrelevant. It doesn't make any sense, okay? So it is not of any private interpretation. Here's what I see over and over again. The reason we come up with these different interpretations is, is basically that's what we were taught in our church, faith upbringing, regionally, uh, culture, ethnic, race, etc. okay? That's why we come up with the different stuff. But most of what we're talking about is truly not doctrinal at the foundation. It is application and therefore becomes religious tradition. Okay? That's how we do it. Believe me, East Texas, we were, were there nine years there back? Okay? We were in the, uh, I won't tell you where because you'll know where it is. But the, the younger one was born in Nacogdoches, suffice it to say, in the Piney Woods. And uh, faith is different over in that area in, in many regards because it's driven first by culture and tradition and then secondly by scripture. And Dale, we were talking about this one time, you know, back in that world, I had to confront the racism that is, you know, in that town, welcome back to the 20s. That's just how it is. They're stuck. And we were dealing with Vacation Bible School, and I made the big mistake of inviting black kids. And the grandpa asked, he pulled up the car and said, uh, who all can come to this here thing? I said, I just put the sign there. I said, well, kindergarten through sixth grade. Yeah, but who all can come? I said, well, how old are your kids? Are they in kindergarten to sixth? Yeah, he says, but can we come? And I didn't understand until he said that. I said, of course you can. Well, what happened then within the church is the uh, ones who were not raised the way that I was took offense at that. And they said, I'll bring my Kool-Aid and cookies, but I'm not staying in the church. And I, had, and I did a whole series on love one another. We love them, but they got their own school. Well, not anymore because civil rights kicked in. But they got their own part of town, which I was shown the first day when I moved there. They got their own churches. That's a broken group. Yes, we believe the Bible, but we, we believe our tradition first. And our tradition says this. Most of us were raised with more tradition than we think we have. Therefore, whether you were raised within a community of faith or not, depend upon where you grew up regionally, historically, all of those things. We bring all of that into our, into our faith walk. And if we're not careful, we will come up with our own private interpretation. So we had, I'm going to rename the title of the study, and, but it fits appropriately with East Texas. And it, and it had to do with uh, uh, 
wives submitting to your own husbands. I think the title of the study was Men, You're the Boss. <laughs> and you could only buy it in that part of the country because that's the thinking. That's private interpretation. You can't come up with multiple end time doctrines because somebody's wrong and everybody cannot be right. And I believe the more we get into studying God's word and letting them teach us piece by piece by piece, many of those questions of confusion and position change. Do not be afraid to change your position when God reveals a, another part of what he's talking about. Because you didn't change the Bible, you changed you. You didn't change God, you changed your understanding of it. So be willing to grow in that way, okay? Oh, goodness. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So does not say Ted Turner and affiliates. It's men who drive the agenda. But holy men of God, and holy doesn't mean perfect. These men, that meant these were people who God chose who had their heart already aimed toward God. And that's how he chose the 12 disciples, Joe, and we were doing that with Nathaniel and all that. Honestly, that's the first time that really occurred to me, that when Jesus called the 12, he already knew their heart, and all of them were looking forward to the coming Messiah. And Nathaniel sitting under the tree was most likely studying the scripture and looking forward to what was getting ready to happen, and he didn't even know what was getting ready to happen. What I just said is God does not just choose random nutty people to write scripture and reveal to them. These are people who already had a heart to seek God and know his way and know his will, and they were moved then by the Holy Spirit to convey God's revelation in written form to us so that we would be prepared for the living revelation of Christ. So, again, moved by the Holy Ghost, but be careful with that one. Don't come up and be careful when you say, God showed me, God told me. I'll listen to you, but I probably won't believe you. Unless you have a verse, according to First Tom chapter 3. Let's move on. First bullet, divine, divine origin and causality. God is the one who caused it. He moved it forward. He gave birth to it. It is his from beginning to end. It is his revelation. He is the alpha, the omega. He's the beginning and the end and everything in between. The whole story is about him. Okay? So Christ is, where'd Jerry go? He is the fulfillment, right? You had that interesting discussion the other day. And I think you answered in a very good way. The scripture is about Christ. Road to Emmaus, we looked at that last week. Wouldn't you like to have that recorded? And he started with the law and the prophets and went all the way through the Hebrew Bible and said, that's me, that's me, that's about me, that's me, that's about me, that's about me. And they still didn't quite get it. They said, huh, our hearts were burning within and something's going on, but we didn't get it until he was gone. Well, again, that's part of progressive revelation. Sometimes God has already given you everything you need. The light just hadn't come on yet, but it's getting there. Okay? It's getting there. Just wait, wait for it. Second thing is human agency. So we have to see the double side of inspiration of Scripture. God is the source. It's his thoughts. It's his revelation of what he wants us to know. And he uses human agency to get it onto the paper. God chose holy men. And that's, somebody caught the bad word in there? Uh, to speak through as scripture was being written. Not the speak to. That doesn't make sense. I corrected it there. Not on your paper. Jeremiah 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, that's what a lot of the NAR guys are claiming for today, but they're about 90% wrong, and I wish people would just stop listening to them. New Apostolic Reformation. It's entered into every church out there today. Believe me. Either into the music, into the form, into... It's entered into everywhere. Uh, we were warned of false teachers and false prophets in almost every book of the New Testament. It's not a surprise. We just need to be aware of what they're doing. So if you're looking to find this out, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, that's when we're doing it. Okay. 
Jeremiah verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. God chose Jeremiah and commanded him to write in a written form scripture so that we might have a record of it. Second part. So the source is God himself through human agency writing it down. It is not dictation. It is not, I found some gold tablets in the hill, and then I got behind the curtain, and then we translated everything that way. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, LDS theology. Okay, good. Uh, or any other stuff. You know, the Virgin Mary showed up to me, so we made that into a grotto, and we put candles, and she told me this and that. No, no. That's not human agency. That's crazy thinking. We need to get away from that kind of stuff, sensationalism. What about the content then? If the source is God, what about the content? And we're back to 2 Timothy. All scripture, not all 200 sacred writings out there, including the, the, uh, the Quran and all of the Hindi ones and on and on and on, over 200. Just type, type into your search uh, holy writings and you'll get a whole list. Only the Bible claims to be from the one and only God given through men as the book of salvation to reveal who God is. And its claims are unique and no other book comes even close to it. Not even close. So all scripture, and for those who weren't here, i uh, give you another little outline for what it's worth. Some of you are already filling this in ahead. By inspiration of God, that is God breathed, that's the word, and is profitable for doctrine, that is God's way, for reproof, that exposes my way, for correction, that's to get my way back to God's way, and instruction in righteousness to stay there so that we might be equipped unto every good work. So when I have somebody say, why do we got to study that church doctrine stuff? I don't know. Talk to God about it. It's his fault. It came from him. He told us, study to show yourself approved. And study is not reading, by the way. So that's the content, all scripture, written verbally. That's your first blank, Jay. It's written verbally in word. Yes, much of it was oral tradition. But throughout, God commanded Moses, write it down. He commanded Jeremiah, write it down. Daniel, write it down. On and on, we find that in Scripture where God chose the people he wanted, and he said, write down what I have told you and showed you. And write it, basically, again, he didn't dictate it, and yet everything that they wrote was exactly what God wanted them to write. Why? Because he oversees the whole process. So don't be afraid that the Bible has been contaminated beyond uh, hope of understanding what it is saying. We have over 20,000 manuscripts of Scripture, about 19,800 and something more manuscripts than the proof that Alexander the Great ever lived. More manuscript proof than all other historic figures combined. We need to know that. These are not just random pieces then that, that people are making up this thing called the Bible. There is more proof in every area that scripture is true and accurate and God ordained, given, uh, protected and all of that than, than anything else in the, in the world. So we can trust it. We can trust it. Okay? Exodus seventeen fourteen. the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book, except it was actually a scroll, but same idea. Habakkuk 2.2 or Habakkuk, whichever part of the country you come from. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Write it down so people can read it and do what they're supposed to do. Those are just three examples. There's, there's many, many, many others. One more, Habakkuk 2, 3, that goes with it. I, my, I skipped the column. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. 
Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Remember we looked at Hebrew as a language and made this statement about it. We have in English past, present, future, and then we have the different pieces within that, okay? Greek has six. Hebrew has two. And here's the two Hebrew forms. It is or it isn't. It is in the past, it is in the present, it is in the future, or it isn't in the past, it isn't in the present, and it isn't in the future. It either is or it isn't. So when God says it is, it does not address chronology. It just makes a statement of fact. God says it is. Who shall I say that's speaking to me? Just say that I am that I am. But God, <laughs> no, that'll do. I am that I am. And just, just leave it at that. The next piece, you can discuss it from many angles. I'm going to try to throw it out where uh, it is a helpful thing and not something that everybody tucks in and guards their territory. Okay? Plenary. Plenary verbal just simply means all of the words are sourced from God through human agents. Therefore, we know the dynamic of language and words that used to mean something 10 years ago mean something different today. Therefore, when we say that all of Scripture is inspired, not just parts of it, that is ultimately going back to the autographs. Oh, I jumped ahead one. Don't fill that blank in yet. Oh, I'm watching you write. <laughs> Okay, let me get my eyes to stop watering so I can read this. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. John pinning that in 1 John 2.8. Revelation 1.19. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. Because here's what's going to happen soon. That's a whole other discussion. That's about a 20-year discussion. But when we talk about plenary then, we're saying from beginning to end, God superintends the whole process. Don't get stuck on words. We looked at that this morning uh, in, was that, 1 Corinthians 12, talking about the gifts. Uh, we did a lot of a little grammar and vocabulary there. It talked about, gosh, I've got to pull it up <clears throat> real quick. Diversities, what was the other word? Different kinds. It's all the same word. <clears throat> In King James, it's simply written for variety, but it's the exact same word. Exact, it's not a different form or anything. Let me find it real quick, and then I can explain this a little better. I get out of that and get over to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's where you find the gifts. You also find it in Romans chapter 12, and you also find it in Ephesians 4, and that's it. Okay, let's see what all I've got highlighted here. Diversities. I know you can't see that, but you can see the color, I hope. Diversities of gifts, differences of administrations, differences in diversity. It's the exact same word. He used a different word for diversity, but it's the same word. Okay, so don't make it into another doctrine. And the last one is diversities of operations. There's a three-fold approach, one by the Spirit, one by the Lord, one by God himself. You have Trinitarian theology in there as well as the breakdown of gifts. We looked at that, and it's pretty interesting to do that study. The point is don't get stuck on the exact translated word because the context will ultimately give you the meaning. Okay. Sometimes it's important, and when it's important to make another point, you can trust that God used another word through that writer. Okay? So it's, it's back to God's in charge of it. So only then, Jay, the autographs. Autographs means what was actually written down by hand by the originators. Understand that Paul used a secretary 
to write much of his stuff because he had whatever problem with writing. And basically at the end of one of his letters, he said, see, here I, Paul, write it in my own hand. He couldn't write the whole thing. His secretary did, and then Paul signed it. But it was Paul's letter. It wasn't the secretary's letter. Make sense? And actually it was God's letter through Paul, through the secretary, to us. So the autographs, the original documents, do we have any of the originals? No, but we have those 20 plus thousand, and here's what we can do. We can compare one with the other and go, hmm, let's do accounting real quick. Let's do bookkeeping, not accounting. Let's say I gave you a number, and it's uh, 369. Everybody write down 369. Read back what you had, and some of you will say 396. I didn't say 396, I said 369. You wrote what you heard, or as we do too often. Did I just say that? That's not what I meant. Okay, those are things that when the whole room of manuscript writers are copying, they checked, double checked, triple checked, quadruple checked each other's words, spelling, writing, and everything. And without exception, somebody made at least one mistake. When you're doing numbers, you can slide. You can slide over a whole you can add a whole column, right? Uh, some of us are Lex Dixic in how we do our words, and we confuse them. And so our little, our older daughter growing up, it was Paul Nailish. No, it's nail polish. That's what I said, Paul Nailish. What moccasins is mossicans. You just said mossicans. No, I didn't. I said mossicans. What? See, you did it again. No, in their mind, it's moccasins. Understand that God watches over that whole process, and don't be worried if there was a publishing error. Anybody never found a mistake in a book because of the typeset or whatever? It doesn't mean the book's wrong, and you also know what it meant to say. So don't make a big deal out of it, right? Just realize that in the process, God is safeguarding checks and balances of spelling, word usage, word choice, where the thing fits in the conversation, things that are chronological are written chronologically, things that are not are not, and everything in between. We can trust that God knows what he's doing and knew what he was doing in giving us the written word. We can trust it. What I see, the bigger problem is, we either don't understand it or we just don't want to do it but it doesn't change any of that. Uh, did I jot down the little pieces there? Oh, good. The little s snowflakes, whatever those things are called. It was not mechanical dictation. The scripture's not mechanical dictation. It's not they went into a trance and they just wrote stuff. If you look at those other sacred writings, you're going to find both of those items showing up and saying that, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's holy writing and it was me mechanically dictated, usually because they went into a trance. The writers of the Bible were free to write what they wanted, the way they wanted, when they wanted, using the vocabulary that they understood, and yet it was God moving through them to ensure the integrity and the accuracy of what was said. That's important. So every now and then I'll say something and Stan will look at me and he'll go, I know what you meant to say, I know your heart. Thank goodness. Because I don't know what just came out half the time. And the church did not give us the scriptures. The Christian church recognized the Christian scriptures. What we just said is, here's the writings. These were excluded. Those were excluded. Let me say it differently. That didn't come out right. A good example, right? Let's say there's 100 books. The church did not take the 100 and say, eh, that one's X, that one's X, check, 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 X, check. No. They were not removed from the Bible. They just were never put in in the first place. That changes how you view the canonization of Scripture. Not added, not subtracted. They just weren't there and recognized by Jesus or the disciples, the apostles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, again, that whole process, while it has its difficulties and did not happen instantaneously, we know the process. And I think part of the reason for that is to protect us from all the false teachings and writings that would claim the same process but don't have that same process. Okay? Some of you got that because I don't quite understand what I said. 
So what about the reliability of Scripture? What about it? Is Scripture reliable? I've had this discussion with students and people throughout the years. Uh, well, you can't really trust the Bible because, look, just, just do a comparison. Uh, <clears throat> on mine, I, I like to use eSword. You may have your own Bible software. I prefer that one for a lot of reasons. You can get lots of freebies, and so I have probably about 20 different translations. eSword, it's free. If you want to unlock the special versions, you can. You just got to pay for it. But it's a powerful tool and probably has at least 3,000 books included in it for free. And you can use it to do all sorts of stuff. You can compare. You can check and say, oh, if you get stuck on a word and you don't quite understand what it means, then you can look it up in a different translation, which would be either dynamic or a paraphrase. You go, oh, that's what, why didn't he just say that? Well, he did. You just didn't understand what the word was. So in doing that, you will increase your vocabulary and you will increase your understanding of how God actually gave us what we needed. Because he picked the correct word at the correct time to say what he wanted to say. No less, no more. Jesus said this in John 17, 17, as he's uh, coming toward the cross. And he's very concerned for his disciples. He's concerned even in his own life, not my will, but yours. And he begins to cry out and pray, Lord, watch over them, protect them, keep them, sanctify them, set them apart for your services through your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, he is the word of God, the living word of God. And ultimately, we can rely upon Scripture because it's about Jesus, and Jesus, by his Spirit, will teach us and convince us that it is what it says it is. So every now and then, I'll get in philosophical mode with some of my buddies, and uh, we'll go down that path, and it's fun while it's fun, and then after a while, it gets really old, and you're just having a what-if conversation. Be careful with those because you can end up forgetting that God's word is God's word. And you can end up with my opinion versus your opinion conversation. So let's, let's, let's run this together in a logical progression here. First thing, these are all actually, the next three things are all one sentence, one thought. They each support different things, okay? The premise is this. Because scripture is inspired, it is inerrant. That's the premise. Because it comes from God, it's inerrant. Well, then we can have the argument over, does that mean the commas, the periods, this and that? <clears throat> Understand, Hebrew had no vowels. Hebrew had no, it was unpointed. It did not have punctuation because it was an oral language. And later on, as the Hebrew Bible was written, vowels were added in and punctuation was added in so that the Hebrew and the non-Hebrew could read it in an intelligible way. So for me to go back and say, well, yeah, the, the, the original Hebrew was inspired, then you better get rid of all your punctuation and all of that because it just simply didn't exist in that language. Now, did God still superintend the process of giving us punctuation? Thank God. Yeah. You open some of Paul's letters and you realize that chapter 1 is one sentence. And you're going, that's 20 verses, guy. But within that are all of these sub-thoughts. And then when you're putting it in dynamic or paraphrase, you have to go, was that a colon or a semicolon or a hyphen or a comma? And you go, boy, I wish I'd paid attention that day on school to know the difference. And that starts entering in because they do mean different things, but they are not part of the original autographs. Those were determined among groups of people to say that keeps the sense of what's being said. And as we pointed out in the 9 o'clock study, if you're reading through your especially King James Bible and it is in italics, it does not mean what they taught you in school. Oh, that's for emphasis. It's in italics because that word doesn't exist in the original language. But you have to have it to make sense in English. Okay? Hope you got that one. 
So that's the first, that's the premise. Because scripture is inspired, it's inerrant. That doesn't mean that there weren't slides and misspellings and that. That's not what we're talking about. We know where those are. We know stuff that was added because whatever guy was sitting there and he, instead of writing his comments out on the side of the margin, they somehow got put into there. And now we are gonna drink poison and handle snakes. It's not in any of the good manuscripts. It's added in, in Mark, okay? Don't use that as a proof text that the Bible's wrong. Use it as a proof text that you better know your Bible history to know that a guy added that in and not God. Therefore, just ignore that, okay? Go to the better manuscripts and you will not find that verse. Pardon? Yeah, there's different things, so just be aware. Dynamic, you know, it shows up. Be aware of that. That will come through study and learning the tools so that you can accurately go and apply Okay, whatever you're trying to do. And don't get the passive Bible. Don't get the Bible. That's right, because that comes straight out of the NRA leader that I won't say his name now because I can't remember. And he added uh, a chapter to the Gospel of John because God told him to. And I'll guarantee you I can find the Passion Bible in many churches that they just thought it was good by. And they didn't realize something had been added on purpose because God showed me and told me. Okay. So thank you, Jay. That was some good insight there. Let's look at the next one. Because then scripture is inspired and inerrant, it has final authority. The foundation is it's God's word. If it's God's word, then what he says is what he means. And if what he means is that's what you are to do, not do, live, not live, that's what he means. So it does have final authority. And when you begin to, because most of us do this, one of my favorite verses that I don't like is do all things without grumbling. <laughs> I don't like, I, I know it's an inspired verse. I just can't do it too well. So I don't like it. So many of the verses that are plain and clear, the problem is that it is too plain and too clear and we just don't want to do it. So don't say I don't understand it. Just say I don't want to do it. And then you're at least being honest at that point. So if it has authority over our life, and what it says about marriage, and what it says about finances, <clears throat> excuse me, and what it says about child rearing, and what it says about, and just make you a big old long list, that's the authority for your decision making. The fact is, all of us have broken all the commandments, we're pretty good at doing it all the time. <clears throat> but it doesn't change what God wants us to do and certainly he wants us to move that direction. So we need to understand that piece of it too, and that in my failing, it just proves that God was right. You're a sinner. <laughs> and that I need help, and I need to stop making my own decisions based upon the latest Christian book I got in the Christian bookstore, which probably half of them should be, if you want to burn books, don't burn the Bible. Burn the stuff in the bookstore. A lot of it should not be there. It is teaching wrong and bad things and confusing people. And rather than turn to the scripture and do the work and let the Holy Spirit teach, we want to hear what whatever said about it. And there's some keys to learn. Learn who your publishers are. Learn which authors you can trust. If I give you a website, I will give you one that I trust. It doesn't mean you need to because everything needs to go in with a little bit of skepticism and just simply say that's better than some of that other stuff. But as I was doing a text back and forth with within our church family <clears throat> and was asked an opinion, I said, well, my opinion is run away as fast as you can. And by the way, here's a link, check it out. It'll speak for itself. Because it has authority, then we go to the last piece. John 14, 26, because the Holy Spirit superintended the process from beginning to end, it's inspired, it's inerrant, it has authority from beginning to end, because of this, you and I can trust it, can trust it. 
there will be many pieces of scripture that we do not understand, and I believe many pieces that in this lifetime we will not ever understand. Part of it is because we are approaching it in the wrong way. That's a piece of the puzzle. Other is because I've never been obedient to the point that I ever got to that point to understand what he was talking about. And everything else in between. But be careful as we grow in our faith that scripture has authority over us. It is God's written word and it is wise uh, unto salvation. It is the source of God's revealing. And again, what, what's the word for revelation? Apocalypse. Apocalypse, thank you. Apocalypse does not mean doom and gloom. It does in the English dictionary, but it doesn't biblically. It means to reveal and unveil and make known what was previously hidden. That will change how you approach the revelation, not revelations. It will approach. It will change how you approach the book. It is the revealing of Christ and all of his entire, it's, 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 to, in my view, it's, a, it's an entire panorama from beginning to end. He's the Alpha and the Omega, everything in between. So don't get caught up in trying to match Scripture with whatever the last current news blurb was that came out. Try to get out of that mode because much of what we have been taught, all of us self-included, we were taught that this is going to happen, this is what's going to happen because that's what the Bible says. And when somebody says the Bible says, I want to say, show me, prove it. I'm not being a smart aleck. I want you to have a logical, rational, spiritual grasp of what you're talking about. Be able to give a defense of the hope that is within you. That is apologetics. If you can't give a reasoned, rational, why you believe what you believe, then you're being led by something else at that point. Okay? Did that, did that last part make sense? hope so. We're all in process. We are all growing, uh, all of us in our life, Jared. Some of the stuff that uh, you're going through, other people have never gone through, they never will. It's your cross, not mine. I got my own cross. You don't want it, believe me. All of us are in that position. All of us have to turn back to Scripture. We can be sure that it is revealed of God through his inspiration, and ultimately we're going to look at, what do you think we're going to look at next week? We've got to get the light turned on. And we're going to look at how that works to a greater degree. And my hope is that all of us, as we continue to grow in our faith, it's helpful for yourself, for your family, for other people around you. I'm telling you, in this little room right here, we have so many different backgrounds of faith upbringing, of uh, culture, of, of everything. And it's amazing that we can even communicate sometimes honest and yet God does it and he's put us together and we're on the journey together and yet separately and he's leading us and guiding us through his word and we don't want to have our vision we want to have God's vision that is the word also for revelation my people uh, thank you my people perish for lack of vision so now the church has redefined the word and turned that into well what do you want to do Let's lay out a 10-year strategy. That's not what the word means at all. My people perish when they have no spoken, written revelation from me. The vision is from God. It is his vision alone. It is ours to basically obey. We are not ever told to have our own vision. Ever, ever. Okay, that was another rabbit. Let's pray. Lest another one pop out of the cage. Father, I do pray that today was productive for each and every one of us here. We thank you that your written word reveals the living word, Christ, that ultimately you are in Christ, the spirit of prophecy. Everything that centers in scripture centers around you. And once we understand that, we'll read the Bible quite differently. We pray, Father, that we would get out of the confused areas of our life, whether it be doctrinally, whether it, whether it be in our understanding, whether it be in lifestyle, whether it be in whatever things we have gotten caught up in, in this sinful world, in our sinful flesh. Help us, Father, to know that ultimately the scripture is the remedy for all of it. It tells us the way out. 
Help us to accept where we are for who we are at this point in time and trust that you are leading us through this journey of life and to not get impatient, to not want to lag behind and stay there and certainly not to try to jump ahead of you. Help us to just follow your teaching and you will take us where we need to be at the appropriate time, the appropriate place. And you'll get all the glory for it. We don't get any of the glory for it. We're thankful for that in the long run. We don't want the glory. In this life, we try to take it from time to time. But we know that in eternity, that will be totally removed from us. We want to give you then thanks for this church home, this church family, your written word, all that we have heard today. Guide our thoughts. Guide our hearts in Jesus' name.